It's great to be with you here today to discuss some of our work related to microbial enhanced focus ultrasound for brain tumors. Very excited about this workshop and the ongoing clinical application of this technology. Just to remind everyone what we're looking at here. So glioblastoma, as many of you know, is a deadly human brain cancer. And many of the treatments that we envision for this disease are limited in their access to the brain by the blood brain barrier. In these patients, often as surgeons, we're able to remove most of the contrast enhancing tumor and the resection cavity can look quite clean. However, within a few months, as you can see here, after chemo and radiation treatment, we start to see new enhancement in the two to three centimeter margin surrounding the original, original resection cavity. And within 17 months, that enhancement has spread across the midline. And at this point, these patients are, are not long for this world. And we believe that by improving the delivery of chemotherapeutics into this region um, around the original resection cavity, where most of the recurrence is visualized, that we'll be able to stall and potentially uh, cure a disease like this in the future. So again, this is another example of a patient where we can see this T2 hyper intense infiltrative margin around the tumor and resection cavity, where we believe most of the recurrent tumor cells are. So this is the key clinical problem. And in a path to accomplish controlled blood-brain barrier disruption into these regions, there's an initial step that may be quite important, which is establishing the accuracy, safety, and at some point, the efficacy of these treatments uh, in separate forms. And the, the real question we had early on in this process is, could we decouple these steps to get this through the scientific process and the FDA approval process. So as part of this, we envisioned an early clinical trial um, demonstrated here where patients would undergo blood brain barrier disruption prior to surgery to aid in the visualization of the planned surgical resection volume. And here you can see uh, a brain tumor that's gonna be removed and some of the tissues within this tumor look quite similar to the native brain. But in opening the blood-brain barrier within the planned surgical resection volume, we can turn these non-enhancing T2 hyperintense tissues into enhancing tissues and potentially use intravascular fluorescent, fluorescent dyes to light up these regions. This enables uh, controlled blood-brain barrier disruption in a region that's going to be removed anyway, and the ability to study these tissues not only for damage, but also for drug delivery purposes. So this is the workflow that we use for this trial where patients undergo standard preoperative neuronavigation MRI scans. And you can see here that stepwise process highlighted in the red boxes, which is our standard workflow and additional steps that include the blood brain barrier disruption components prior to surgery. And for us, this, this works very nicely into the established workflow where patients undergo these preoperative MRI scans, usually the morning of surgery. Um, and we believe that it's important to do this within six to eight hours prior to surgery to have this effect. Here's an example of one of those patients that had a T2 hyperintense, not enhancing frontal lobe tumor that underwent blood brain barrier disruption in the early days in a three by three grid. You can see some of the grid patterns demonstrated there in the new contrast enhancement without evidence of new T2 star changes within the bottom right image. Here again is that new contrast enhancement within the planned surgical resection volume. We can navigate to these areas because this MRI scan becomes a neuronavigation scan, allowing us to um, preferentially and accurately sample these treated tissues and then compare them to other tissues within the surgical resection volume as controls. In the operating room, when we navigate to these regions, we can see the new fluorescence nicely, especially when we see the new contrast enhancement uh, following focus ultrasound. So we envision as others have in preclinical models to deliver numerous possible therapeutic entities using this technique, including nanoparticle and stem cell agents, in addition to small molecule and antibody agents, which have been shown by others as well. So in another piece of the puzzle to getting to a point where we could treat repeatedly with focused ultrasound and deliver chemotherapeutics and other therapeutic agents on a monthly basis following the standard radiation temozolomide treatments that happens 
following surgery in most patients, we envisioned a clinical trial where focused ultrasound is used on a monthly basis in conjunction with the standard maintenance temozolomide that happens monthly for these patients. And this is the second study that has enrolled numerous patients around the world and shown so far to be quite safe and effective at opening the blood-brain barrier in these, these margins around the original resection cavity with focused ultrasound. So it's in this way, especially with repeat treatments, that we are opening the opportunity to use focus ultrasound to deliver new drugs, not just temozolomide, but new drugs that wouldn't otherwise get into these regions in the brain. Here's an example of what some of these treatments can look like around the resection cavities. Now the technology, this is the Insightex system, is um, geared to be able to conformally shape and steer the beam such that regions can be shaped and treated around the resection cavity with controlled energy and monitored real time using acoustic emissions to gauge and dose the treatment going in uh, or the energy going into these uh, areas. And here you can see the, the target, the non-enhancement prior to focus ultrasound, the acoustic emissions map within the target regions, and then the contrast enhancement within the resection cavity or the, the area around the resection cavity. So this is all accomplished through closed feedback loop control, which leverages acoustic emissions monitoring. And here's an example of the microbial emissions that can be measured and recorded during the treatments. And it's, the, it's believed to be the subharmonic emission here in the black box. And this is the, the emission uh, that is actually used to guide the closed loop controller in the system. And it's believed that the intensity of this subharmonic is, is really correlates best with blood brain barrier disruption and stable oscillation of the circulating micro, micro rules. Here's an example of a patient undergoing treatment with a short video. We can see the map here drawn around the resection cavity, the target grid, and the energy being delivered. The system is monitoring the subharmonic, thresholding it below a certain level. If, it, if the energy delivered needs to go above a certain level, the system will stop. A power threshold is set here at 24 watts. And we can see the energy being deposited within this target grid as the system moves through the treated area. So this is a very powerful controlled system that allows the operator to not only monitor real time the effects being generated within the tissues, but also dose the regions to a certain de desired level. And here you can see the calculated harmonic doses based on the acoustic emissions data where a relatively low harmonic dose is listed here and shown with minimal subharmonic emissions and then a moderate harmonic dose and then a higher harmonic dose. And these regions correlate fairly nicely with new contrast enhancement in the post-operative imaging as seen here. So this total system allows this closed feedback loop control during the treatments to guide and dose the energy delivered within the targeted and, and affected regions and really allows a safe and effective way to shape and control the blood-brain barrier disruption within the brain. So to, to finish, we, we believe that especially with these new systems and also with the monthly treatment and safety data that we can now really begin thinking about new therapeutics that wouldn't otherwise get into the brain and using them to effectively treat patients with glioblastoma. Thank you very much.